Welcome to Harvesting Clouds, where we take a practical approach to learning and leveraging clouds. This video is part of the series where we are comparing Azure Virtual Machines versus AWS EC2 instances. In this particular video, we will be creating Azure Virtual Machines. So let's dive right in. To create an Azure Virtual Machine, I have a couple of options to get started. I can either click on this Create a Resource button, or I can click on these three lines and then click on the same link for creating a new resource. Once I'm here in this wizard, I can either click on one of the images that are listed under Getting Started, or I can even go to Compute option and then go to the Virtual Machine wizard. Or I can even search on the marketplace and then find a specific image. For example, I can search for Red Hat Linux and get started by creating a Red Hat Linux directly from the marketplace. Mm -hmm. For this particular video, I am going to use Windows Server 2016 Data Center. I'll click on this link. It will take me to the Create a Virtual Machine Wizard, where it takes me to the basics page. I'm using one of my friend's sub subscription. Here as a best practice, I'll either create a new resource group or reuse an existing one. Resource group is like a grouping of all your resources. It's like a folder, but only a logical grouping of all the resources within Azure. So here I have already created a resource group that I'm going to leverage. It's called rg-harvestingclouds-infra01. I'll give a name for the VM. I'll give it a prefix. And let's say that the accounts department has requested this VM. So I'll give it a name that will have some inkling that it belongs to that particular department. Next, I'll select the region. There are multiple geo regions where you can deploy your virtual machine. I'll select East US as the default since this is closest to me. And then you can select availability options. You can select redundancy wherein you can select availability zones or availability sets. We will be discussing about what an availability zone or availability set is. Basically, it is providing you redundancy. If you're deploying the same application in multiple virtual machines, then if Microsoft is performing a maintenance or if the power failure occurs in the Microsoft data center where this virtual machine is hosted, then your VM will be getting the SLA of 99.99% based on if you have deployed it onto an availability zone or availability set. Spot instances is another feature that Microsoft has provided. If Microsoft has extra space lying around in a data center, then you can leverage that. It reduces the cost significantly for your VM deployment, but you should only use this for non-critical VMs, wherein even if the VM goes down, it does not matter to your application. As the SLA is not guaranteed when you are using Spot instances, but the cost it, you can save up a lot of cost by leveraging spot instances for your non-critical workloads. Next one, we have the size. I can click on change size and there are multiple options available. I can even search by the VM size if I know which size I want to target. Size is based on which you are built. If you can see the cost per month is calculated based on the size that you select. Over here, the cost is being shown in rupees since this subscription is belonging to my friend who lives in India. If the subscription belongs to you and you are residing in United States, for example, it will show up United States dollars over here. So let's leverage DS2 V2 as a size. And the size tells me that how many virtual CPUs will be there, how much memory will be linked to your virtual machine. So these two parameters are very important. These define how much compute power your virtual machine is going to get. The other features are the max limits of data disk, max IOPS, max temporary storage, and the support for premium disk, etc. that this particular size will carry with it. I'll click select once I have selected the size. I'll provide a username and password. Since this is a Windows VM, I'm providing a username and password. If it would have been a Linux VM, I would have leveraged SSH keys to configure my virtual machine. 
Next up, I have configuration for the inbound port rules. This is where you configure what ports needs to be opened on the virtual machine. You can either configure it here or the configuration will also be available in one of the subsequent screens when you will be configuring the networking aspect of your virtual machine. Finally, on the basics page, that is the first page of this wizard, you have the option to use something called Azure Hybrid Benefit or Hub Licensing. What that means is if you already own Windows Server license on premises, then you can save up to 49% of the cost because you already have the license. Then why pay for that particular license when you are building VMs within Azure? Once you have selected all that, you can click on the next to configure the disk options. On the disks page, you have the option to configure your OS disk as well as the data disks. For OS disk, you can select one of the three types. The first one is your standard HDD, which is your standard hard disk type. It has the lowest IOPS as well as the low cost. So you have to optimize the cost versus the performance. IOPS is your input output operations per second. How fast the data can be written to the disk, how fast the data can be read from the disk. That is being dictated by what is your option that you select over here. Standard HDD will give you the least performance, but very low cost as well. Premium SSD is what I recommend that you should be using for all business critical applications. Over here on the, in the bottom panel, you can create multiple data disks. Simply click on create a new disk, provide a name for the disk, provide it a source. It can be created from a snapshot or from a storage blob that is a VHD lying on a storage account, or it can be an empty disk. You can provide it with the size as well as a type. You can select from here. For example, if I want to assign it a premium SSD of 64 GB as an additional disk, I can do that. You can only select one of these tiers and you are built based on that particular tier. And then you can hit OK. A new disk will be created for you and it will be attached as a secondary data disk on your virtual machine. For now, I don't need that. So I'm going to delete it and proceed to the next section, which is for networking. Under the networking section, you have the option to select your virtual network as well as the subnet and public IP address for this particular VM. The virtual network is something that you will always get from your administrators. This is something that will already be set up. This is a one-time thing that you generally set up when you are configuring and designing the whole environment in Azure, you're designing the whole strategy, how the virtual machines will sit. You will create a separate network for the development environment, for separate one for QA, testing, you add, as well as your production environment. I don't have any other virtual network. So for this particular video, I'm creating a new one right from here. I can click on create new and can select the properties. The primary properties are the address range for a virtual network, and there needs to be at least one subnet within that virtual network. And I can provide an address space and I can even edit that address space within that subnet. Right now the subnet name is default and this is the address space that it has. There will be a public IP address. Generally in a actual scenario, you will try to avoid the public IP address assignment to a virtual machine as much as possible since this exposes your virtual machine to the public space. To block that, you need to configure firewall in terms of network security group. Either you need to have this configured. This is nothing but a set of rules for how the inbound traffic and which traffic from the inbound should be allowed and which traffic going out of the VM, the outbound traffic should be allowed. And this is what I was discussing earlier that this is where when you open RDP port for 3389, this is where it is configured to be allowed. You have a couple other options. Accelerator networking is a new feature. It is a new type of networking that gives you lower latency. Load balancing is if you are having multiple virtual machines and you want to deploy those virtual machines behind a load balancer, then you can do that as well. Next up, we have the management section. In here, you can configure the monitoring aspect of the virtual machine. You have the boot diagnostic settings, which I recommend that at bare minimum you should have enabled. 
these help you in troubleshooting the boot up process of the virtual machine. You can go even more invasive and get more data from within the OS by enabling OS guest diagnostics. Both of these diagnostics need a storage account to send their log files to that particular storage account. You can figure that over here. You can either select one of the existing storage account in your environment or create a new one. You have multiple other options over here as well, like configuring identity and configuring backup, which we'll take a look at in a later video. But auto shutdown is another setting that I highly recommend that you enable on your virtual machine. You set it to on, provide a shutdown time, which is after your working hours, and then set your time zone to what wherever you are located. Select notification before shutdown if you want to get notified and provide an email address for the notification. Next up, we have an advanced section where you can configure multiple things like extensions on the VM. Here you can select an extension to install. The extension could be like chef extension or puppet extension if you want to manage the configuration on the virtual machine. You can even provide cloud init file for Linux VMs through which you can configure the VM when the VM loads up for the first time. Further down, you have even more advanced options. One of these options is to deploy your virtual machine in a proximity placement group. This is one of the latest features that Microsoft Azure has provided while creating the virtual machines. When you deploy two virtual machines in a proximity placement group, Microsoft ensures that those two virtual machines, they are deployed closer to each other physically on the data center. That ensures that the communication, the traffic flowing between those two virtual machines will have much lower latency. You also have VM generations. Generation two is the newer one. It has a lot of new features like UEFI based boot architecture. It has increased memory, OS disk size limits. So why won't you use generation two? The reason for that is you want to stick with generation one for now. The reason for that is it does not, the generation two does not support some of the Azure features. For example, as you can read from this note, it does not support Azure disk encryption. So for now, I would recommend stick with generation one unless until you need these uh, new features. Otherwise you can upgrade to generation two but you lose on some of the Azure platform features. Next up, we have the tagging of the virtual machine and its related resources, not just the virtual machine, but the underlying IP address, its NIC card, it's, that is its network interface, the storage account that will be created, the virtual network that we are creating, everything will be tagged, whatever we provide the tag values over here. Tagging is the categorization of your resources. This helps you when you are pulling billing reports. Then, for example, if you have a separate uh, cost center internally, let's say CC0135 is the cost center for the accounts department. Then later on, at the end of the month, when you are pulling the billing reports, you will be able to filter on the cost center and bill that particular department for the resources that that they are using. Finally, you review everything. Microsoft Azure, it runs some validation in the background. If the validation passes, it shows you this message in the green bar that the validations have passed and the create button is enabled. You also have the option to download an ARM template. What that is, how to leverage that, we'll be checking that out later on, but for now, just go ahead and click on the create button to create this particular virtual machine. The deployment is submitted. It will soon take me to a screen where the deployment status will be shown. And after a while, when we'll come back, the deployment will succeed and we'll be able to navigate to our virtual machine. All right, so few minutes have passed and the deployment has complete. Now I can navigate to virtual machine. I can either click on go to resource or I can navigate to home, navigate to resource groups from this particular section. My resource group is already listed since I have already visited that resource group recently. I can click on that particular resource group 
and it will show me all the resources that were created when we were creating the virtual machine. It not only created the virtual machine, it also created all these related resources. Let's take a quick look. As I did not have any virtual network, it created a new virtual network for me. It also created the storage account where my boot diagnostic logs will be kept. It created a public IP address that will be linked to my virtual machine through which I will be connecting to my virtual machine now. It also created a network security group. As I said earlier, this is just a set of firewall rules which dictates how the incoming traffic is going to be allowed and which outgoing traffic is going to be allowed from the VM and to the VM. Network interface is what connects this particular virtual machine to the network. Specifically, it connects the virtual machine to a subnet on the virtual network. This is just like the network interface card or the NIC card that exists on your laptop or on your desktop. It's a virtual resource corresponding to exactly what that network interface card is on your laptop. Just like your laptop has a MAC address, this also has a MAC address. This also gets a private IP address as well as the public IP address. The last resource we have is of type disk. This is the managed disk, which corresponds to the OS disk. As you can see, it says so in the name as well. So I'll click on the virtual machine resource, navigate to my virtual machine. It will show me all the settings corresponding to the virtual machine. It will show me the size that I selected. It will show me the subscription and the resource group that it, this belongs to. It will also show me the private IP address that this has. If I want to connect to the virtual machine, I can either click on connect or click on the connect under the settings. Even if I click on the connect here and I select RDP, it will take me to that section under the settings. I can select whether I want to use the public IP address to connect or if I'm connected to Azure through express route or site to site virtual machine, I can also connect through the private IP address. But since I do not have express route or site to site VPN, I'm going to leverage public IP address to connect to the VM. I can either directly do RDP to this particular IP address at port 3389 or I can click download RDP file right here. Save the RDP file. Click on that to open that up. I'll hit connect. It will ask me for credential. I'll click on more choices. Click on use a different account. And in here, since the account that I provided was a local account, I'll use dot slash to indicate that this is a local account. And then I'll provide the credentials that I provided while creating the virtual machine. It will give me a warning. I'll hit yes to connect. So finally, I am able to connect to the virtual machine that we created just now. That concludes this particular video where we saw how to create a new virtual machine within Microsoft Azure and how to connect to that particular virtual machine. We will be delving into the details of the virtual machine in Azure in subsequent videos. But for the next video, we will be comparing the experience to how you create an EC2 instance in AWS and how that differs from the virtual machine creation within Azure. Thanks for tuning in.